Written by Brian St. Clair King and published by Vajra Enterprises, Tibet runs at 223 pages in the two-column format. Unlike my previous few reviews, this game has a more specific setting it places its focus on, specifically Tibet in 1959, with a slightly supernatural bent to the conditions of the region presented. The book starts with an author's note that they tried to present the myriad sects and cultures neutrally, but I'll weigh in on that at the end of the review. A special note should go to the Monastic Edition, which is a free PDF version of the game that contains the same general rules as the full book, but with the caveat that it only allows you to play as monk characters and use their associated mechanics. However, this review will focus on the full game instead, but I will recommend the Monastic Edition as an introductory piece. Layout-wise, the game feels very much like an indie RPG published in the late 90s in its formatting and choice of font. Artwork is scarce, but there are a great many photographs displaying the world and people of Tibet. Additionally, many of the sections throughout the book have an in-brief segment first, which summarizes that relevant section. Unlike the rule segment in Heroes Against Darkness, this doesn't interrupt the flow of the book too badly, and is only used for the more lengthy parts. Chapter 1 focuses on the setting of Tibet. As I said before, the game is implied to take place in 1959, with the tensions regarding the invading Chinese slowly rising, and their approach rousing malevolent spirits that were long dormant. While the chapter definitely shows a great deal of the factions, sects, and culture of Tibet, the supernatural and real world parts of it create a kind of clashing tone between the historical and the fantastic. This is something we'll be getting back to in the future. Chapter 2 focuses on character creation. Tibet takes a point-spending approach with much of the creation aspects, in particular the attributes and skills. A starting character gains 90 points to distribute between the nine primary attributes. Agility, Awareness, Charm, Endurance, Intelligence, Karma, Speed, Strength, and Willpower. Attributes may be further customized with sub-attributes, which are a situational modifier when using the attribute in a specific way. Sub-attributes may grant a positive or negative bonus, but only one sub-attribute can be associated with the aforementioned attribute. In other words, you may have only one situational modifier per attribute, be it positive or negative. In addition, the character may divide 12 points between the health attributes, body, blood, and incapacity. The third step in character creation is in choosing a class, although based on the description of each class it's more reminiscent of Warhammer's careers than the idea of a typical character class. A character class primarily determines the cost of skills and the character's income, but certain classes may have skill choices unique to them. For example, the possession skills that an oracle have, or the see hell approach that a revenant has. However, each class has unique advantages which may be purchased with bonus points. The fourth step is skills. Characters may spend 100 points on skill ranks, the costs of which are outlined by their chosen class. Each rank in a skill grants a plus 4 bonus to uses of said skill, and players may purchase up to 5 ranks in the skills they have available to them. As I said previously, some classes have skills exclusive to them. Also, while a 6th level is available, it's implied that this is a legendary mastery of said skill, and should be used only with GM permission. The fifth step is attachments and personality. Attachments are worldly aspects and beliefs that characters grasp onto, and are part of the Buddhist aspects of the game's mechanics. They may be changed or used to one's advantage, but losing them completely is a difficult process on the step to enlightenment proper. A starting character chooses five attachment from the following categories, physical, self, and universe. At least one must be from the universe category. The final step involves the use of bonus characteristics. This is the game's equivalent to an advantage-disadvantage system, but you are not given a set amount to start with. The only rule is that the total cost of advantages and disadvantages must equal zero. In addition to the bonus characteristics listed in this section, each class is has a set of exclusive choices available only through that class. The character creation chapter also contains the relevant information on supplies, goods, equipment, and the full list of skills. Personally, I think this section should have stuck to just character creation and left skills and inventory as its own sections entirely. As a result of this, the chapter feels very crammed together instead of putting proper sections for each material. The final section in character creation is advancement detailing how experience is gained and spent. Additionally, this section details the concept of disciplines, which are a more specialized class that one can take if they meet the prerequisites, although actual disciplines in the book are very few. Chapter 3 focuses on the mechanics of the game. 
Tibet's core mechanic is similar to that of the D20 system, that being modifiers plus D20 versus a target number. Curiously, opposed rolls do not have the opponent's result as the target number, but instead both rolling a standard roll against separate target numbers and comparing who had the higher relative result. It's implied to reflect competing at things of different difficulty, but to me this comes off as an unnecessary step. Following that, we have a list of uses for each of the core attributes I mentioned earlier. While most are just showing how it would be used for certain actions, the important one in this section is Karma. Unlike most of the other attributes, Karma will fluctuate the most in a given campaign, but will always default to the base amount on one's sheet at a rate of one point per day. In simplest terms, acts which bring compassion increases Karma, while actions that bring suffering decrease it. While intent is irrelevant to any gain or loss, mental suffering or compassion and future acts can have just as much effect on karma as present actions. Karma's base may change at the end of a session based on the difference between current and base karma and has a maximum based on the number of attachments one currently has. In game, karma's main effect is emanation, which is a field of karma that affects the people around them positively or negatively. Furthermore, emanation allows for positive or negative magic to be performed more easily depending on the type of karma someone has. The chapter then goes into further detail regarding the health attributes, the hit points of this game. The main factor of whether body or blood points are removed by an attack is determined by that attack's form. Body points are reduced by blunt force trauma, while blood points are reduced by edged weapons and edged attacks. When one's body points are at zero, further attacks deal double blood damage while further damage when both are out reduces the incapacity pool. Next comes armor effects, which take the form of two parts. Armor rating, the minimum attack result to deal damage, and protection rating, the amount of damage reduced. While this fits in with the standard concept of armor class, what I find odd is how the armor piercing effect is listed as pierces as X, where X is the damage it's treated as before applying reduction, even though it can't do more than its base damage. This struck me as an unnecessary step on AR when it could have just as easily reduced the protection rating for an attack. The next major segment to go over is the combat system. Much of the combat is very similar to its use in the D20 system, with initiative and the flow of combat of a round based on it. The primary wrinkle in this is the concept of range. Tibet's use of range is a retooling of most games' reach mechanic, and means that based on the weapon, you have a set of ranges where someone isn't too close or far to attack. The final segment in this chapter is Enlightenment, which specifically delves into the means to remove one's attachments via discovering and eliminating them from oneself. Attachments can be exchanged easily, but removing them requires a great deal of positive karma and becomes more difficult the less attachments that one has. Of course, this assumes that one is taking the route with the Sutras, which is a slower route. The Tantras are faster and a potential route to enlightenment, since they add temporary karma to the effect as a spell, but at a risk of intensifying one's attachments, granting a whole new attachments, or worse, insanity and death. Chapter 4 focuses on adventures and is the closest thing to a GM section in the book. While it begins with suggestions on how to unite the individual players together, most of the chapter is focused on story seeds emphasizing different styles of play from the military end of things to the more political or supernatural affair. Following that is a series of adversary examples from the mundane to the supernatural, as well as how they could be used in a given campaign. Rounding out the book is an NPC creation system, a set of introductory adventures, and ending with a review of certain charts and terms. I think the best way for me to summarize my thoughts on Tibet is to say it's a mishmash. Its mechanics are fairly strong, mixing aspects of White Wolf Storyteller system, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, and D&D's D20 system into a system that mostly works, save for a few odd choices. While combat is intricate, I especially like how combat skills work in the game, I'm not sure the necessity of that given the lethality of combat in it. Since it uses an advantage-disadvantage system in addition, it suffers the flaw of being potentially gamed by min-maxers unless carefully observed by the GM. To its credit, it does an effective job of displaying the people, regions, and cosmology of Tibet as well as an effective use of Buddhism both in this game and as a general reference. It is the mix of setting flavor where I think the game is at its weakest. Specifically, I refer to the insistence of it being in 1959 with the inclusion of the Chinese presence while maintaining the supernatural aspect. I've seen some arguments on various forums about whether the depiction of the Chinese in this book is racist. 
I don't think I'm learned enough to speak on that with any authority, but some of the neutrality that the book is striving for doesn't come across as strongly with the Chinese aspect, who are pretty much perceived as villainous. Furthermore, I think it's a situation where it can't play both hands at once. It would need to either focus on the real-world invasion materials or the inner workings of Tibet and its supernatural aspect. It can't really do both. Objectively, this makes it somewhat weaker than Vajra Enterprise's other games that don't seem to suffer this issue from what I've seen. But the Chinese aspect can easily be ignored by an observant GM. While I can't say everything works in the game, what is presented in the book is fairly strong material for the roof of the world and its myriad peoples, as well as a nice introduction to Buddhism in role-playing. Overall, I give Tibet the role-playing game a 7 out of 10.